Star Trek Voyager's take on the Star Trek universe existed on screen for seven seasons, and along the way, there was a lot more happening behind the scenes than you know. From the show's impressive impact to some crazy drama between actors, here's the untold truth of Star Trek Voyager. Paramount used Star Trek Voyager to help launch its new mini-network United Paramount Network, or UPN, in January 1995. UPN only had a few shows when it launched, and only aired on Monday and Tuesday nights between 8 p.m. and 10 p.m. That same month, Voyager was joined by the sitcom Pigsty, comedian Richard Ginny's Platypus Man, the Richard Grieco action drama Marker, and the sci-fi western series Legend. Voyager's Caretaker was UPN's first telecast on January 16, 1995, and 21.3 million viewers tuned in. Of the network's five launch series, Voyager was the only program to survive its first year. Yes, believe it or not, even a winner like Platypus Man got the axe. Voyager went on to outlive other early UPN series like The Sentinel, the sci-fi drama Nowhere Man, and the hit teen sitcom Moesha. Voyager was also the only early UPN series to last seven seasons. When it came time to cast Captain Janeway, Voyager's casting team looked at a lot of actresses. Among the candidates was Linda Hamilton of the Terminator films, Susan Gibney, who played the recurring role of Dr. Leah Brahms on Star Trek The Next Generation, and Buck Rogers alum Aaron Gray. Despite the competition, the role eventually went to Canadian actress Genevieve Bujol. However, Bujol didn't last long, quitting just a day and a half into production. Voyager co-creator Rick Berman said of Bujol's departure, This was a woman who in no way was going to be able to deal with the rigors of episodic television. Documentaries like What We Left Behind and The Captains include cast and crew talking about 16-hour workdays, so it's tough to blame Bujol too much for abandoning ship. Kate Mulgrew was then cast in the role she'd keep for the show's run. Do you like the Ferengi? I do like it very much. Why? I... The Ferengi. That one? That's a Ferengi. Star Trek has helped launch plenty of acting careers, and Voyager gave an early role to someone known today for blockbuster action flicks. Dwayne The Rock Johnson, still mostly known as a WWF wrestler in those days, made one of his first non-wrestling television appearances in the Voyager Season 6 episode, Sankatsa. While the rest of the crew is enjoying shore leave, Tim Russ's Tuvok and Jerry Ryan's Seven of Nine take a shuttle to examine a nearby nebula. On the way, they're attacked and captured by aliens, running a popular fighting arena. Tuvok is badly injured, and the arena's owner uses the injured Vulcan as leverage to make Seven fight for him. Her first opponent is The Rock, who plays an unnamed Pindari champion. In a fun fourth wall-breaking moment, The Rock gives his signature eyebrow raise to the crowd before defeating Seven in the ring. Most Trek fans have their own pick for their favorite Trek series. So if a Trek fan ever tells you that everyone loves or hates one series or other, never believe them. We're not trying to tell you Voyager is the best Star Trek show, but some numbers have revealed something interesting about the series' enduring popularity. In 2017, Netflix reviewed data from over 100 million subscribers in almost 200 countries to figure which episodes of Star Trek were watched the most. At the time, Netflix carried all the franchise's series produced between Star Trek The Original Series and the 2005 finale of Star Trek Enterprise. Netflix didn't count first or second episodes because those generally have more views than others. Voyager and The Next Generation were the only two series with episodes in the top 10 most watched, and of those 10 episodes, six belonged to Voyager. Those six episodes helped to prove the lasting popularity of both The Borg and Voyager Season 4 newcomer Seven of Nine. Most of the six episodes are very Seven and Borg-centric. They include the series finale Endgame, the two-part Scorpion and Dark Frontiers, and The Gift, which is the episode immediately following Seven's first appearance. Behind the scenes, Mulgrew resented the addition of Seven of Nine, whose good looks helped boost Voyager's ratings. On 2013's Girl on Guy podcast, Ryan talked about feeling physically ill at the thought of doing scenes with a particular Voyager co-star. She didn't name Mulgrew, but she mentioned details making it clear it could be none other. While researching his book The 50-Year Mission, co-writer Ed Gross looked into the feud and got more answers than he expected. One unnamed cast member claimed Mulgrew tried to enforce a rule that Ryan wouldn't be allowed to use the bathroom during work because it took too long to get her in and out of costume. Harry Kim actor Garrett Wang said Mulgrew's anger wasn't initially directed toward Ryan, but once it was, the effect on set was awful. Chakotay actor Robert Beltran told Gross, 
If it was me being insulted and Kate was a man, I probably would have taken a swipe at the guy. To her credit, the Voyager captain owned up to her behavior toward Ryan. Mulgrew told Gross, This is on me, not Jerry Ryan. I'd hoped against hope that Janeway would be sufficient, that we didn't have to bring a beautiful, sexy girl in. One of the more prominent recurring characters on Voyager was Ensign Samantha Wildman, played by Nancy Hauer. Voyager's unexpected journey to the Delta Quadrant separated the pregnant Ensign Wildman from her husband by about 70,000 light years. On the bright side, her half-alien daughter Naomi eventually turned into another Voyager fan favorite, becoming close friends with Ethan Phillips, Neelix, and even the emotionally aloof Seven of Nine. Interestingly, Samantha Wildman's name has a special meaning. Wildman first appeared in the second season episode, Elogium, co-written by Jimmy Diggs. The same year he sold the script, Diggs' wife almost died. A kidney transplant saved her life, and Diggs learned the donor was a seven-year-old girl named Samantha. He wrote a letter to Voyager's producers asking them to name the episode's new character, Samantha. Congratulations, Samantha. Diggs wrote, the ancient Greeks believed the gods would reward heroic mortals by placing them in the stars. By honoring the memory of this child, the producers of Star Trek will accomplish the same thing. One of the more popular characters on Voyager was also its best source of comic relief, the Doctor played by Robert Picardo. The Doctor is an emergency medical hologram meant only for short-term use, but his job gets much more involved when Voyager's human doctor dies after the ship is thrown into the Delta Quadrant. Speaking to StarTrek.com in January 2020, Picardo explained a special spontaneous moment from his audition. After reading the last scripted line, I believe someone has failed to terminate my program, Picardo improvised with, I'm a doctor, not a nightlight. Picardo said the line yielded big laughs on set. What makes the ad-libbed line funny is its similarity to lines from Dr. Leonard Bones McCoy from Star Trek's original run. Actor DeForest Kelly frequently delivered variations of, I'm a doctor, not a, but Picardo apparently had no idea. He said, I faked my way through the audition and ad-libbed a DeForest Kelly joke without knowing it was a DeForest Kelly joke. I am a doctor, not a voyeur. Tim Russ actually had a few Trek one-off gigs before landing the role of Security Chief Tuvok on Voyager. On Deep Space Nine, he's a Klingon mercenary who helps take the station hostage in the episode Invasive Procedures. In the Next Generation Starship Mine, he's one of a group of criminals trying to steal trilithium resin from the Enterprise. In 1994's Star Trek Generations, Russ plays a lieutenant on the bridge of the Enterprise B in the film's opening. But before he did any of that work, he auditioned for the part of Geordi LaForge on The Next Generation. Speaking to TrekMovie.com in 2018, Russ said that he was ultimately relieved to have lost the Geordie role to LeVar Burton. Why? The dialogue. Russ explained, The role of Tuvok was somewhat more organic and much easier in terms of dialogue. I am glad I didn't get stuck with all that engineering tech talk. That kind of dialogue doesn't do anything for me. Russ also had the distinction of getting to appear in one of the few episodes in which Voyager characters could cross over into other series. Tuvok shows up in the Deep Space Nine episode Through the Looking Glass, though it's not quite the same Tuvok. The episode takes place in the Mirror Universe first made famous by Star Trek the original series, Mirror Mirror. This Tuvok appears as a member of the Terran Resistance fighting against the Klingon Cardassian Alliance. One of Voyager's recurring characters was Ensign Vorek, played by Alexander Enberg. Vorek is a Vulcan engineer who often worked closely with Bellana Torres, played by Roxanne Dawson. Vorek develops a romantic interest in Bellana with violent consequences. In perhaps Vorek's most memorable appearance, the season 3 episode Blood Fever, Vorek experiences the Vulcan mating period and chooses Bellana as his mate. He forms a telepathic connection with Bellana, causing her violent Klingon mating instincts to emerge. The situation ends in a duel between Bellana and Vorek, which both thankfully survive. Between 1997 and 2001, Enberg appeared in nine episodes of Voyager as Vorek, but it wasn't the first time he appeared in a Trek show or even the first time he appeared as a Vulcan. Enberg was cast as a Vulcan named Torek in The Lower Decks, an episode in the middle of the Next Generation's final season focusing on the Enterprise's rank and file. With Enberg not only playing Vulcans on both shows, but with both characters sharing rhyming names, some fans have wondered if there could be a connection between Vorek and Torek. According to Voyager co-creator Jerry Taylor, who also happens to be Enberg's mother, there could be. In the 2012 book Star Trek The Next Generation 365, Taylor implies Torek and Vorek may very well be twin brothers. And since she's their mother, we guess she would know. 
As Voyager's first officer, Commander Chakotay is often forced to tell Captain Janeway things she doesn't want to hear. Fittingly, actor Robert Beltran was known for speaking his mind on what he likes and doesn't like about Voyager, regardless of the consequences. By 2000, Beltran had aired enough dirty laundry in public that producer Kenneth Biller told SFX Magazine that he thought the actor, quote, should stop whining and do his job. Speaking to StarTrek.com in 2012, Beltran talked about not feeling fulfilled on Voyager. He complained, You're doing the same thing every week with a new variation. I didn't like some of the things that were going towards the last three years, and I risked being fired because I wasn't happy creatively. According to Beltran, Chakotay didn't have a lot of interesting relationships after the departure of Martha Hackett's Seska, his former lover who's eventually revealed to be a Cardassian. Beltran revealed, After Seska left, it was only that relationship with the captain that had depth to it. Chakotay and the other characters, there wasn't much of a relationship there. And Beltran has one problem with Trek that a lot of fans might consider downright heresy. Beltran hates the Prime Directive, the Starfleet principle that forbids interference in alien civilizations for any reason. In 2012, he told CNET, The idea of leaving any species to die in its own filth when you have the ability to help them? It's a bunch of fascist crap. Years after the series' run, it can be easy to forget how important it was in 1995 for a woman to be leading a Star Trek series. Today, we're growing accustomed to female-led action films and series, including Star Wars epics and superhero blockbusters. But in the mid-90s, it was still a big deal, especially in science fiction. Mulgrew left an important mark on our culture, and it's felt far beyond the world of television. Speaking to Trek Movie in 2019 about the 25th anniversary of Voyager, Mulgrew was asked about highly visible female politicians like Stacey Abrams and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who'd named Captain Janeway as an early influence. Mulgrew said she made a surprise appearance at one of Ocasio-Cortez's rallies, and that when they announced Mulgrew, Ocasio-Cortez gasped. She turned. And when I approached her, I think she kind of fell. Mulgrew said Ocasio-Cortez related stories of watching Voyager as a child, and that when they lost their screen, they had bad reception in their house. And often, the television was just black and white. She'd listen to it like a radio show. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about Star Trek are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.